It is August 16th, 2024, and ceasefire talks are ongoing in Qatar, although there are countless questions as to whether we could actually see some sort of a ceasefire deal between Israel and Hamas. Is that something that Netanyahu is willing to agree to, even though he has tried every way possible to add more demands, to delay any kind of agreement up until this point? Is that something that Hamas would agree to? Would they be willing to give up more hostages without a concrete plan for what happens after this war ends. Because as we've heard from Israel, they claim that their goal is to defeat Hamas. They're going up to the party they're negotiating with, telling them that they still intend to wipe them out completely, even as they're trying to make a ceasefire agreement with them. But there is a lot of pressure involved in reaching a deal. And that pressure is also apparently coming from the U.S. as Biden seems to think that if there is a ceasefire agreement, then it would mean that Iran would hold off on retaliating against Israel for a string of attacks and assassinations that Israel has carried out in recent weeks that has included the killing of Palestinian diplomat and Hamas political chief Ismail Haniya while he was visiting Tehran. So what are we looking at here when it comes to all of the latest tensions? Well, we got into all of that earlier with a special guest. So let's take a listen to that conversation now. Joining me now to discuss is Kavorik Almasian, a political commentator and founder of Syriana Analysis. Kavorik, thanks so much for taking the time to join me. Thank you so much for having me. Actually, today, Facebook Memories reminded me of an interview you did with me a few years ago back when you were working at RT. So I just saw the interview again. <laughs> oh, really? That is too <laughs> funny. Well, we've we've come full circle, right? Yes. And still, still talking about the latest politics in exactly. the Middle East. And I know that you know today is an important day because there is some sort of ceasefire talks going on in Qatar for a second day, although a Hamas delegation isn't in attendance. And the stakes seem to be really high here because, as at least Biden seems to believe, Iran could hold off on its response to the latest string of attacks and assassinations carried out by Israel if there is a ceasefire. How do you see the current situation? Is there any world in which Netanyahu agrees to a ceasefire and Hamas is also on board? So there is very little hope in a ceasefire, and I hope I am wrong on this, uh, because a ceasefire means uh, a relief for the Palestinian people, hundreds of thousands of them stuck in the Gaza Strip in very dire situation, inhumane, let's say, situation. It's a big uh, open-air concentration camp, according to human rights organizations, and I think that this will definitely help the Palestinian people to recover. However, what is going to come after the war, the, ne- the day after the war. This is the real question, because in the Israeli mind, uh, they have to impose the sovereignty of Israel over every inch in historic Palestine. They say from the river to the sea, there will be only one flag, and that is the Israeli flag. So they intend on capturing the Gaza Strip slowly but surely, and they would like to establish a complete Zionist rule over the entire Palestinian territory. And they have made it illegal uh, uh, to recognize a two-state solution under now the Israeli law. Therefore, there is no, uh, in my opinion, there could be no fruitful negotiations between the both sides if the Palestinians cannot have their own state in this case. And additionally, Israel has assassinated uh, Ismail Haniyeh, who is considered a moderate figure in Hamas, and he was a negotiator. Imagine if uh, two countries go or two parties go to negotiation and you kill the messenger and you kill the negotiator. How could you reach to um, a settlement uh, after that? And the appointment of... um, the military uh, commander, let's say, of Hamas, in this case, as the head of the political bureau, also indicates that Hamas is getting also more radicalized in terms of, and when I say radicalized, not in a negative way, but in a way that they wouldn't uh, really trust in negotiations with uh, Israel any longer, and that's why they withdrew from these negotiations. Now we have a situation in the region that, in my opinion, is uh, in a, on a very um, hot waters, And it could explode at any moment. And this is where the Iranian factor uh, comes at play. The Iranians, uh, in my estimation, they don't want a regional war. And they wanted to avoid this type of confrontation with uh, the Israeli side. Uh, However, there are other types of calculations. And that is um, that 
is related to deterrence. If Iran doesn't respond to the assassination of Hani and killing of a senior politician, a guest on your territory, then Israel will continue bombing Iran. And this is what happened in Syria. Once Syria lost its deterrent factor, and that was the chemical stockpile in 2013, over 1,000 airstrikes being conducted by the Israeli side on Syria when Israel didn't dare to bomb Syria uh, regularly like uh, like this. So the Iranians, in my opinion, um, in a dilemma, uh, they have to respond, but at the same time, they know that this is also Netanyahu's game. Netanyahu didn't assassinate Hania um, in a way that we can interpret it as a miscalculation. No, it wasn't a miscalculation. It was calculated very, very well. And similarly, the assassination of Fuad Shukr, the second man in uh, Hezbollah in the southern suburbs of Beirut, was also intended on crossing the red line of Hezbollah. So Israel deliberately crossed the red line of Iran and the red line of Hezbollah with the hope that these two parties would retaliate in a harsh way that would cross the red line of Israel. So Israel would respond in a harsh way against them, and this would lead into um, a regional war with global ramifications, and this will force the American side to intervene. And that's why we see Biden has sent uh, many of the warships and aircraft carriers against to the Mediterranean. And the quantity and the quality of these warships and the aircraft carriers are of a bigger, of a higher status compared to uh, the warships and the uh, aircraft carriers that he sent in April of this year after the Iranian retaliation. So in my estimation, um, Netanyahu wants war in the region. And this was something that I read in Haaretz a few days ago. Uh, There is an opinion article, brilliant one, titled, and this is an Israeli newspaper, and it's not like an Iranian-affiliated one, says Netanyahu wants world war. In Netanyahu's mind, uh, when he went to Congress and he gave his infamous speech, he tried to make two things clear. One, that uh, this is a war, a civilizational war between the civilized people and the barbarians. And the barbarians are people like myself coming from the Middle East in his uh, estimation. And secondly, he made sure to, uh, to, to deliver a message to the Americans that he is allegedly fighting uh, for the interests of the American, in, for the American interests in the region. So as much as they give him security and military aid as much as he can serve the interests of existential interests of the United States in the region. But the truth of the matter is, is the other way around. It's the Americans fighting the, the, the wars of the, um, of Israel in the region and not Israel fighting the wars of the United States in the region. This is in my understanding. So he just drew a clear line there. I want war in order to defeat the barbarians in the region and you, the Americans, have a duty to help me. And in this case, uh, when I wage this war and you come to uh, in support of my war, then this will be also considered uh, a victory for the United States. And if we see the curve of the empires and we see that the United States is um, in its, uh, let's say, absolute hegemon is being in a decline or in a decay, uh, probably there are people in the United States who also believe that this war is necessary to uh, restore Uh, their status as an absolute hegemonic power after the Ukraine war, which was humiliating for uh, the NATO side and and also the rise of China. So probably there are people in dark rooms and especially uh, people that we don't really see or recognize or know their names. They are pushing for war in the region with the hope that they they could reshift the balance of power again on the side of what they call the collective West or the rules-based order. Okay. And I I think it's good to keep in mind exactly as you were saying, kind of the intentions that are at play there, because watching this as an American, watching the U.S. military ramp up its presence in the region, I'm going, what are you doing, right? We we already clearly are not winning this proxy war against Russia and Ukraine. You're trying to gear up another proxy war against China over Taiwan. And now you're getting more involved in the Middle East, which the US has been trying to get out of. And as you were pointing it out about Iran, I mean, I'm with you. I don't think that they want a regional war. I think they've made it very clear. Look, one, obviously that would be costly for, you know, not only Israel, but also for Iran, for Hezbollah, for anyone who gets involved and for the surrounding civilians. But on top of that, it would also 
take the focus away from the Palestinian people and their suffering and everything that they're going through. So how do you view the position that Iran is in right now? I mean, obviously, Israel has carried out this this string of attacks. They've violated Iran's sovereignty. They've targeted and killed a guest within their country. So Iran is kind of in this position where they have to respond, but they can't respond too lightly or else then everyone looks at them and says, oh, what are you doing? They can't respond too hard or else then we see a regional war. How do you see kind of the position that Iran is in right now? Um, as I said, Iran is in a dilemma. In April, when they retaliated against Israel, they wanted to send a message in a, uh, more than they wanted to uh, inflict a huge damage uh, to Israel. They wanted to say in April that if we want to hit any place, we can hit. And this is what they did. They have sent uh, hundreds of drones and some of the Scott missiles and the um, uh, ballistic missiles to Israel. And uh, probably 10 missiles fell in the places that they wanted to hit. And this, is, this was the message. But it seems that this has not deterred uh, the Israeli side, so they have committed another act of aggression against Iran. And I would like to mention that when I said this is calculated, I mean, Israel uh, was able to kill Haniya in any other place, but they have picked the place in Iran. They were able to kill him in Qatar. They were able to kill him in Turkey, but they have picked in Iran because they wanted this retaliation from the Iranian side. And in the Islamic mindset more more or less also it's a it's a levantine it's a middle eastern caucasian let's say culture when you have a guest in your home we say my guest is safe in my place this is a very important cultural aspect imagine killing the, your guest in your home this is like a double crossing the red line in the in in the mindset and the culture of uh, of iran so now iran has to retaliate, but they have to retaliate in a way that they don't start a regional war. So this is the dilemma. In my opinion, if the Iranians uh, want to wait for the negotiations now to see what would happen with the uh, so-called uh, ceasefire talks, if these uh, talks collapse, uh, Iranians have two choices. Uh, one, to retaliate in a very calculated way, but to inflict uh, heavy damage on the Israelis, uh, which is a very, very difficult thing to do in these conditions, because even if the Iranians uh, retaliate in a very calculated way, the Israelis could trigger anything in their country, in a false flag attack of anything, to say that this is coming from the Israeli side to, to respond uh, in a harsh way and drag in the Americans. The second way they could retaliate is to swallow their pride and their dignity and the, the, the strike that they received, which is a huge blow for the Iranians, but to pursue and continue their nuclear program. And this is the case that has been widely now spoken and discussed in the Iranian uh, society and is Iranian press uh, and journalists, intellectuals are asking the question. So we have a fatwa in Iran uh, by Khomeini and Khamenei. Both of them have banned uh, based on religious uh, interpretations that uh, Iran should not develop a nuclear weapon. It should be banned. It is immoral. It is illegal. It is against the rule of God. It is against their religion. Because in any nuclear warfare, you cannot really spare uh, innocent civilians. So innocent civilians would be harmed. This is the this is how they measure it. But now that they uh, they see that this existential threat is coming closer to them, they could change their nuclear doctrine. And under more defensive position, they would say that now we should have a nuclear weapons uh, because uh, these nuclear weapons would deter Israel to attack us. If they are not going to use it on Israel, but when you have a nuclear weapon, just like North Korea, India, Pakistan, you create the conventional nuclear deterrence vis-a-vis -vis your enemy. So your enemy doesn't attack you and you won't attack your enemy. So both sides establish something like a de facto truce between the both sides. I think the second option would be more uh, logical for Iran to pursue. It's a more long-run project. It's more strategic option for them because in, in, in the regional um, uh, dynamics that we can see with our objective eyes, Iran is going to be the uh, the regional power in two, three decades. And the American side is in a decline, in a decay. So Iranians 
don't have an interest to open an all-out war and destroy every achievement that they have scored vis-a-vis -vis the American camp in the region by using soft power, by relying on allies in the region. Opening a war, it's not in their interest. So that's why I say maybe they will swallow their pride and pursue a nuclear program, and but they will need six months to enrich to 80% and then one and a half year to have their first nuclear uh, warhead. And this will require cooperation with China and, and Russia. So would the Russians and the Chinese help Iranians in this case? That's a very big question mark. Um, I cannot really answer. We have to really ask the decision makers in Moscow and Beijing in this case. <laughs> yeah, and it's interesting to me to see kind of the situation that these countries are in because obviously when it comes to Iran, Russia, and China, I mean, they have all had their own versions of tensions with the U.S. Some to a much greater degree right now. But you have the U.S. in this position as we were talking about it. You know, it, Israel carries out this string of attacks and assassinations. The U.S. acts like it knew nothing about it, right? They act like they just found out that, oh, you killed Ismail Haniyeh or I guess Israel still doesn't claim that they did, but the U.S. acts as if they weren't aware, right? And then on top of the increased military presence in the region, you've also got the State Department announcing another $20 billion in weapons sales to Israel. So the U.S. on its end, I mean, they're acting like they're getting all the profits, they're helping out their ally. But looking at this, I wonder... Is the U.S. really dumb enough to get dragged into a regional conflict or are they almost relying on the patience and the endurance of Iran in this, knowing that, look, Iran doesn't want a regional war. And so it's almost as if the U.S. is kind of letting Israel get away with so much, expecting that the other side won't take this to a full war. But yet the U.S. still gets to showboat and act as if it's, quote unquote, defending its ally mm -hmm. here. Rachel, I'm sure most of your viewers are from the United States, so I would like to ask them this question. Where uh, has this $20 billion came from? <laughs> You're right. I mean, that, is, 20 billion... that is an excellent question, especially right now when you've got the U.S. struggling to keep up with Ukraine. I'm going, are you really able to add mm -hmm. yet another? I mean, I just don't think that the U.S. has the industrial capacity to keep up with all of this, but of course they print the money, so they think mm -hmm. that they are more than capable capable of, of turning those dollars into weapons and bullets just magically. So guys, brace yourself for more inflation in your country and brace yourself for higher bills and higher grocery uh, prices because this is how they can finance wars. Uh, the military industrial complex in the United States doesn't have, uh, let's say, a fixed budget to finance these wars. So they print the money and they recycle it in different parts of the world, including in Israel, in Taiwan, in Ukraine, in Syria, in Iraq, in trillions of dollars uh, in the Middle East. Been completely wasted. And when I say wasted, means that it didn't come as um, a profit, a financial profit for the benefit of the people in the United States, but rather for the benefit of a very few elites. The second thing that I want to point out here is, is uh, does the United States have a president? I mean, who is in charge of the United <laughs> States? Uh, this is a serious question because if Biden, uh, if we consider Biden a president, I'm sure he's not in charge and he doesn't take decisions. He doesn't sign on these papers. It's all a big lie. So who is in charge? Is, 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 is it Anthony Blinken? I mean, who in his mind believe that Anthony Blinken can lead an administration? Anthony Blinken is a really average diplomat. He is not really a high IQ or a strategist who can lead such big decisions. So the bigger question is here, who is leading the United States? And who is in charge of such decisions? Is it Netanyahu, who is now leading these decisions? Or there are groups over groups in the United States that we cannot see? In, uh, like Because when we analyze, we have to really take into consideration the data, the tangible uh, uh, things, and the people that we know, how they think, and how could they take decisions. In the 70s, in the 80s, we had Brzezinski, we had Kissinger, we had Madeleine Albright, we have this and that. So we knew that there are dif different individuals and different characters who, uh, and we can predict what type of decisions could be taken. 
But we're not able to do that now because we don't know who is in charge of taking these decisions. And I suspect that there are um, individuals, donors, and uh, those who participate in financing the politicians in the United States. Uh, those are the real rulers of the United States, the oligarchs. Those are the ones who probably have an interest in opening a big front. Because remember, only a few weeks before the Russian offensive on Ukraine, only one week, not even weeks, we kept hearing about the great reset and the the, the new normal, and uh, the, we have to reset the economy. We have to present the uh, uh, centralized uh, digital currencies. They wanted to wipe all the uh, debt of the United States, thirty five trillion dollar, by presenting these uh, invisible digital centralized uh, currencies. So there could be people who are interested in a great reset of the economy by flaming up the region completely, because this will lead into, believe me, into starvation. It will lead into shortages of food. It will lead into shortages of fuel, electricity. People will get sick. There will be diseases everywhere if such a war erupts because it is the center of the world. All the trade routes, the maritime routes, the energy resources are there. So when you flame up that region and you create such a big mayhem and a catastrophe, then you're the ones who then come and present the solutions. So create a huge problem and uh, and present a solution for a very long run. We're not speaking of a solution for 10, 20 years. No, these people are thinking 100, 200, 300 years ahead and how they want to shape the, the world accordingly in a way that serves the system. And the system here is this unipolar world. And this unipolar world is in the hands of a very, very few people. And these people have subjugated the, the, the world for a very long time. And today when I, I posted something on X about the refugee crisis in Europe and how there is uh, uh, negative sentiments now against refugees, migrants, and I'm myself a migrant, right? But my opinions have evolved during time, 10 years in Europe, and I say today that the same people who created these wars and created the refugee crisis and the migration and imposed sanctions on these people and strangled them by looting their natural resources, they're the same ones are now destabilizing European countries in order to cause vertical uh, divisions between migrant, refugee, and against uh, the indigenous people there, right? So this is all uh, divide and conquer strategies. It's cultural wars. The real war is between all of us against this very tiny, uh, I don't want to even call them an elite any longer because elites at least have some intellectual integrity, but they are in charge of so many banks and financial system transactions, everything is in their hand. So it's our struggle against them and not between us, but it's a vertical struggle against them and it's not a right and left. Right and left is just a distraction in my opinion. Oh, absolutely. I'm with you on that one. And I think that, you know, the more that we fight between each other about, you know, the right and left or whatever versions of that we have, the more that those at the top keep to continue to get away with what they're getting away with, right? They continue to grab more power from all of us. And it, it makes it even more concerning when we're in this position where we're looking at a number of different wars all around the world and going, well, none of this is good for us as the human race, right? None of this is leading anywhere good. And yet it's the elites at the top that are sitting there going, yeah, we know that's why we're in this position going forward. I know that there is certainly a lot at stake here all around. And I really appreciate you taking the time to join me today to break down the latest here. Kaborik Almasian, a political commentator and founder of Syriana Analysis. Thank you so much for your time and insight. Thank you so much, Rachel, for having me. It's always a pleasure to be with you. If anything in this video resonated with you, be sure to like it, share it with your friends, leave a comment, and as always, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to keep up with all of my work, make sure that you're subscribed to my page on Substack. That's rachelblevitz.substack.com. If you want to support my work, you can also check out my page on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash rachelblevins. That's where you can sign up as a monthly paid subscriber and join the community there. As always, thank y'all so much for all of your support, and I'll I'll see you next time.